Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next webinar series. I am Aparna Deshmukh, Technical Director with Next, and I will be your moderator for today's session. We are eager to learn all about our today's webinar titled Practical Applications of Non-Metallic Engineered Cementitious Composites, ECC. A PDF of this presentation can be found in the handout box. You can use the PDF to follow the presentation and take notes if you desire. ACI is an approved education provider for the American Institute of Architects and the International Code Council, and this webinar has been approved for one learning unit. Please, make, please take note of our disclaimer on the screen for the next webinar series. Now let's get started with a short description of our today's webinar. The webinar will explore the practical applications of engineered cementitious composite, ECC, emphasizing the unique properties in engineering contexts, including cost, environmental performance, and challenges compared to the conventional steel reinforced concrete. Our learning objectives for this webinar are as shown on the screen. Now let's welcome and introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Victor Lee. Dr. Victor Lee is a James Rice Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of Engineering at the University of Michigan and is renowned for his work in non-metallic composites for sustainable infrastructure. He is the inventor of bendable concrete, uh, ECC, through uh, Throughout his outstanding research career, he has received numerous awards, including the International Grand Prize for Innovation and the Rylum Lifetime Achievement Award. The Technical University of Denmark honored him with an honorary doctoral degree for outstanding contributions to materials science. He is a fellow of AAC, ASME, World Innovation Forum, and ACI. Dr. Lee has been on TV and in magazines showing how his work is making a big impact around the world. We are honored to have him with us today and let's extend a warm welcome as we eagerly listen to his presentation. Okay, very good. So let me begin by thanking the organizers uh, for giving me this uh, unique opportunity to speak to concrete industry uh, up and down streams from materials to applications to construction and so on. And um, to have this opportunity to share with you this evening what we have learned over the last few decades of making concrete that is ductile. I know for many, this is somewhat of an oxymoron to think of concrete as a ductile material, but that's what I'm going to uh, try to get across today. And that is, it is feasible to create a new kind of concrete known as ECC or engineered cementitious composites, which is totally non-metallic and which behaves in a ductile manner. So let me jump right there. What do I mean by ductile. Um, and so here is a schematic showing a tensile stress versus strain relationship. Now for normal concrete, just for contrast, um, it would have a linear elastic behavior and then a sudden drop in load when a crack forms uh, across the specimen. For ordinary fiber reinforced concrete, FRC, uh, it follows the red curve, meaning that after the crack forms, the load capacity continues to decrease as the crack opens up. So this is a localized fracture behavior. In ECC, the behavior is quite different after the elastic portion of the stress strain curve. When you pull a specimen in tension, it actually undergoes something that looks like steel strain hardening. It's actually not steel, of course, but it strain hardens. The behavior looks like that. And then it only fails after the load rises 
to a certain amount and the deformation stretches up to like three to five percent. That's a very large deformation because when you look at concrete or FRC, the load drops at about 0.01% strain. Okay. So we are talking about straining the material several hundred times before it finally localizes and forms a real crack. But before that, you have damage on the specimen in the form of micro cracking. The strain capacity is what characterizes the ductility of the material. So the ductility of the material of ECC is three to 500 times that of normal concrete. Now, if you put the material under bending, uh, you can actually bend it like what I'm showing you on the right-hand side of the, the right-hand panel. In contrast, if you bend a piece of normal concrete without the steel reinforcement, it simply fracture into two pieces. That's the general commonly accepted behavior of normal concrete. So the material has the possibility of decreasing the amount of steel reinforcement and in some cases possibly eliminating steel reinforcement. So uh, we'll see more of that in a moment, but uh, I am pretty sure many of us in the audience would ask the question, what makes this ECC material so different from normal concrete uh, or from normal fiber reinforced concrete? Well, um, in many ways it's similar. If you look at the ingredients, you have the air inside, of course, you have cementitious binder, you have water, you have fine aggregates. Uh, we remove the coarse aggregates and replace it with synthetic fibers. And I emphasize the word synthetic fibers. Uh, so even though steel fibers could be used, we have found out that that is not the most efficient. There are some characteristics associated with synthetic fibers that makes it uniquely uh, effective and efficient to reinforce the ECC. So that's a very simplistic way of looking at what ECC is. Um, the more complete picture is that there is a mathematical model of, of, uh, of, of uh, assembling the uh, type of ingredients, the size and the amount and the composition in detail. Um, so these are described as the physical and chemical properties of the three phases of any composites, the fiber phase, the matrix phase, and the interface between them. The mathematical model makes sure that these three phases uh, interact with one another in a manner that results in what you saw just now as a ductile composite. So the, there is a theoretical design basis for the ECC. I wouldn't have time to go into that, but there is plenty of publications on this topic for those who are interested to pursue and learn more about the design basis of this material. Now, if you look at the real stress strain curve, here is a real specimen pulled, ECC specimen, undergo elastic and then strain hardening. And you see the jumps during the strain hardening process, the low jumps, they are reflecting the small micro cracks being formed uh, on the, along the length of the specimen. Um, and this is the ductility that gives rise to the possibility of designing resilient structures, structures that resist to fail by brittle fracture. Um, and I'll show you examples of that in a moment. Um, and while I'm on this slide, I also want to mention that there is also the uh, feasibility of keeping the cracks very tight. Um, so the, the crack widths you can see on the y-axis on the right-hand side of this plot uh, shows the micro cracks dimensions, the width of the cracks, increasing up to about 1% strain. It has a value of roughly six, 60 microns, uh, 0.06 meters, centimeters. Uh, and the uh, 
the, and then it stays on uh, at six, about 60 microns. Uh, we are now able to design ECC with even tighter crack widths, and that has implications on the structural durability. Let me see if I, uh, yeah, there it goes. So there you see the, uh, the uh, crack widths maintaining very tight, even when the composite is strained up to about 4% in this specimen and remains less than 60 micron in crack width. Um, so typically for ease of, of uh, understanding, we typically say that ECC, uh, if properly designed, could have a tight crack width less than 100 microns at any stages of the operation of the structure. Now what is interesting is not just the width of the crack being tight, but also if you look at this animation of a piece of ECC that has been pre-cracked and then exposed to a wet environment, you see the crack closes by itself. So there is a self-repair ability of this material, making structures even less needing, needing repair during its use, during its use phase, during its life cycle. So the tight, the fact that the material has very tight crack width intrinsically and not, and I, when I say intrinsically, I mean to say without the need of other things like steel reinforcement, it keeps the cracks very tight and it repairs itself, it heals itself. So this, these are two features of ECC enables the development of very durable structures. So let me summarize what ECC is. Uh, in a nutshell, it's a ductile concrete material with a tensile capacity of three to 5%, several hundred times that of normal concrete or FRC. The crack widths during the damage stage, during strain hardening is maintained below 100 microns it self heals, uh, but all by itself, with the only need uh, being air and water. Uh, and it has low permeability, even when you overload it and get the material into the strain hardening stage. The material also has very high MOR uh, because of the prevention of the brittle fracture from the tensile side of a beam, for example. So I'm going to show you just quickly some structures that has been built with ECC material. They involve uh, buildings, they involve transportation infrastructures, uh, they involve water infrastructures. Uh, these material, these structures can be built precast uh, or on site um, and um, they can be used in uh, new structures as well as in repair or retrofit. So you see a variety of different structures uh, have been built with this ECC or repair with this ECC material over the last uh, decade or so. Um, and they are now all around the world in different parts of the world. Um, so the material is still very relatively new, uh, but it is emerging, I would say, uh, from the lab to uh, the field. So let me go a little bit deeper into uh, infrastructures that built of ECC with the goal of uh, free maintenance, uh, minimizing maintenance. So here uh, is an application for re repairing the uh, Hitaka Dam in Japan, which uh, was uh, eroded and have the concern of uh, loss of uh, uh, <clears throat> resistance to water uh, and penetration and potentially endangering the downstream area. So this was repaired with a with layers of ECC material. Uh, and in this particular application, uh, this material was sprayed on. So uh, the material can definitely be cast on site but it can also be applied by a short creating approach. And this, this application actually happened quite some time ago. So we have lots of experience and data collected on how they work over 
a long period of time. Uh, that was in Japan, and this particular uh, testing application was carried out by VDOT, um, and they were interested to use ECC as a grouting material. Uh, so the conventional grout, they call it non-shrinkage grout, grouting the uh, joints of steel box beams to form the bridge deck. Um, and what they found is that there is often the problem of water leakage along this uh, joint area. Um, so in that particular study, uh, they use ECC and they also use UHPC. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the very high compressive strength of UHPC. But as you might imagine, in this particular application is the tensile deformation that is important to control the cracks and water permeation through the joints. So as a result, uh, VDOT reported that the ECC field joint was the only one that did not leak after some time. Uh, in this application. So that's an interesting finding. Uh, also, the material has been applied even larger scale in as tunnel linings. This is another example also in Japan, the Hida tunnel, um, and the dimensions are given here. Again, short creating, um, and the material is used to uh, resist uh, movement, ground movements, as well as water penetration. So taking advantage of both the tensile ductility as well as the tight crack width and self-repair behavior. All right, let me move on to uh, another angle, another very broad uh, use of ECC is for uh, infrastructures against seismic loading. Um, and this is in relation to enhancing structural res uh, resilience. Uh, so for example, Kajima has been building tall buildings uh, with uh, a super beam and damping device tied to these uh, connecting columns. And uh, they have uh, now worked with ECC where the material is used in these uh, coupling beams, now denoted in yellow form, uh, four pieces uh, on each side of the building. And this building has worked very well. So here is a ECC uh, coupling beam uh, precast in a precast yard and then brought to site, dropped into location to form the coupling beams. Uh, and they are tied to the uh, the uh, the columns as well as the floor slab. And um, you can see that the reason why they are so interested in doing using this material is the very large uh, contrast in behavior between ECC and regular steel reinforced concrete under cyclic shear loading, which the coupling beams are expected to be subjected to during an earthquake. So in the regular RC beam, uh, you see the fracturing of the concrete uh, and exposure of the steel reinforcement uh, with the large cracks basically giving up uh, on the uh, low carry. And the uh, ECC in contrast forms two sets of micro cracks perpendicular diagonal to one another. Uh, because of the fully reverse cyclic loading. Um, and the hysteresis looks are very different as you might have expected from the images that I just showed. For the RC, uh, you reach a peak load and then subsequently the, load, the envelope load capacity drops. Uh, whereas in the reinforced ECC case, you have a delay of the peak load, reaching peak load, and then even after peak load is reached, it's very stable uh, the, of the envelope, and the also much fatter, so implying much more energy absorption by the coupling beam, which is really a major purpose to prevent damage of the building. And these uh, ideas has been put to full-scale use 
uh, in tall buildings like this one in Tokyo on the left hand side uh, and another one in Yokohama not that far from Tokyo uh, and yet the, another one in Osaka. Uh, this is the last one is a 50 story building with 200 meters high um, and it's the tallest high rise in Japan. All right, let me shift gear. Okay, um, okay so here is an yet uh, another application, fairly recent one, uh, just a couple of years ago in China, where they have a uh, flower exhibition uh, uh, expo, I believe, uh, yeah, in Shanghai. Um, and ECC was used to form this interesting structure uh, which has a height of about six meters and a length roughly of 20 meters. Uh, so thin wall structure. And the reason why I mentioned this uh, particular structure is not only its artistic shape, uh, but also that there is no steel reinforcement inside at all. So, so this can truly be described as a non-metallic structure uh, with just the ECC and no steel reinforcement. Um, and it's obviously taking advantage of the high tensile ductility uh, of the material. All right, the last uh, example uh, application I want to like to share with you. This is also fairly recent. Uh, we carry out this uh, pavement demonstration on the grounds of uh, of our what, what we call the M City grounds, where we where our um, autonomous vehicles are tested. And the old concrete, uh, the, these are very common features that we find in parking lots where you have concrete cracks coming out from the manhole. Um, and we, we uh, replace part of that with a ECC that we developed for Aramco. Uh, and this ECC has relatively high MOL uh, and maintain its high tensile ductility. And as a result, we were able to design this pavement demo with only half the thickness of the regular uh, pavement, concrete pavement, no expansion joints needed and no steel. And as a result, uh, we found that this kind of application can lead to about 40 some percent of reduction in cost and over 50 percent reduction in carbon footprint. And now this is an interesting, uh, these are interesting numbers because if you look at the cost of the material on a unit uh, volume basis, let's say per cubic yard, uh, that could be higher cost compared to normal concrete. But when you take advantage of the properties of the material and design the pavement with those properties in mind, you come out with a pavement that actually reduces the cost as well as the environmental impact. And of course, that's the installed these are the installed costs and, and uh, embodied carbon uh, on day one. In the long run, when the material do not require repeated repairs, then one can expect uh, rewards in terms of reduction in operational cost and operational carbon. All right, so let me summarize here. the. If you say, ask what's the value proposition of using ECC in infrastructures, I would mention at least uh, these fives. Um, reduction in construction time, for example, elimination of the need for expansion joint cutting on pavements, that's just an example. Uh, reduction in labor, uh, reduction uh, in maintenance requirements, uh, I already mentioned cost and carbon redu footprint reduction. Um, so these are values uh, that the material can bring to civil infrastructures. Um, as I mentioned, in many different kinds of applications, in transportation definitely, in buildings, in energy infrastructures, and in uh, new and repair.
Now, uh, some have concerns of how to apply this material. Uh, and I will be the first one to say that we, the material needs to be properly processed. Um, and there are some differences compared to normal concrete. But if you look at this example where we use ECC on a link slab in, on a bridge deck in uh, near my university, uh, and this is using a ready mix truck, uh, charging the regular concrete truck, and then adding fibers on the top here. You can see here uh, the quality control part, uh, the uh, slum cone measurements. Uh, the material is actually very flowable uh, and they just flow into the uh, farm work and screening and finishing of the surface. So in many ways, it's similar to operating and using equipment that are typical in concrete construction. Uh, so let me come to a conclusion and see if I can answer some questions. Uh, so ECC is ductile, I mentioned this a number of times, and the value of ductility are many, but here, at least in this presentation, I emphasize the value it brings to resiliency of structures subjected to extreme loads like earthquakes. Uh, and the fact that the material have ability to control its crack width by itself, and having the self-healing ability also uh, enables the uh, durability of structures, of infrastructures. Um, and the uh, reduction in project costs and construction time can be expected if one uh, takes advantage of the behavior uh, and the properties of this material in the design of the infrastructure. Now, um, the state of the art is such that the material is ready for adoption. We have seen increasing number of applications now in different parts of the world, uh, in Europe, in Australia, in Southeast Asia, in the US, of course, um, and in different domains, buildings, transportation, water infrastructure, and so on. Um, so it's not everywhere yet. Uh, there is still a lot to learn about translating the material from lab to field, but there is increasing amount of information and experiences. And um, that is the reason why uh, ACI NICS uh, will be publishing an industry-facing uh, user's design guideline, and uh, ECC guideline for users. Uh, and uh, we hope that this uh, document would be helpful uh, for uh, accelerating the field use of this material. Uh, for those who uh, become interested or deeply interested in this subject, uh, there is a lot of published materials and uh, you can certainly find plenty on our research group website, and I'll point out the the address, the, the link for you, the web link for you in a moment on the next page. Uh, but I want to quickly mention not all is, is easy. Uh, there are remaining challenges. We have overcome many of them, but I see uh, remaining challenges ahead of us. And these include these two on the bottom of this slide. And that is the current building design code, for example, ACI 318. Um, much of the document focuses on compressive strength, um, whereas the material, the ECC material, has unique advantages in tensile properties. And uh, the ACI document basically uh, renders the responsibility of tensile low carrying to the steel. Uh, but in this case, the ECC is ductile in tension and therefore um, it would be useful to consider this uh, behavior which is not present in normal concrete uh, in future editions of the uh, ACI building code. 
Uh, that would help structural designers a lot, I have heard. Um, and so there is work to do on that part. Um, and then there is also not a ready uh, supply chain uh, of the different ingredients. So this is something that I think is uh, perhaps to many is a chicken and egg business. If there is not enough use yet, then there, nobody is going to supply the ingredients. And if they are not being supplied, it's difficult to use them. So I hope ACI working with industry uh, will be addressing some of these problems. Um, and I know other countries are already doing so. So uh, I will stop here. But I did promise the link, the web link, and this is it here uh, for those who are interested to learn more about what has been uh, studied and findings uh, of both basic and applied nature. Uh, you can find very large amount of documentation on our research group website uh, of this link. So I will stop here and leave time for answering questions. We truly yes, appreciate you. Out Thank you so much for this outstanding presentation and, and for graciously sharing your ex extensive expertise on uh, with us. Uh, so let's move to our question answer session. Our first question is, um, I'll just read out the questions which we have received. So our first question is, could you please explain the difference between ECC and HPFRCC, that is high performance fiber reinforced cement composites uh, and, EC, uh, and ECC. Yeah, so I think the question is, uh, could you please explain the difference between ECC yeah. and HFR? HPFRCC. Sure. Sure. Uh, let me uh, try to do that with this slide. I happen to have this slide at the. Yeah, and there is also a here. follow up to this. Um, is there any study regarding comparison of ECC produced by using other types of steel fibers like micro steel fibers or PVA fibers? OK, I can address each of them separately. OK, so in general, one can look at UHPC, uh, high performance FRCC, as a material with very high compressive strength. Um, and if you uh, typically uh, say 200 megapascal or above, uh, the blue curve shows an example of this. Uh, now, this is a tensile stress strain curve. Okay, so in tension, UHPC. Uh, while it has high compressive strength and it's designed for that purpose, it doesn't have the high tensile ductility. It actually drops, uh, the load drops at about 0.1, 0 0.2% strain. And if you look at ECC, this is a very common version that has been used a lot, studied a lot, and has this very large strain capacity for several percent strain. So it may not have the high compressive strength, let's say in this case 40 versus 200, but it's designed to be ductile in tension, not high compressive strength, but high ductility in tension. Now, if one really wants both, and if, I, if one say I want the high ductility of ECC, but I also want really high compressive strength, it's actually doable. There are several groups that have studied high strength ECC, now shown in red. Um, and here you can actually go up over 200 megapascal in compressive strength. Intensial strength is almost doubling that of the uh, UHPC and ductility maintains like four or 5% strain. So that's the difference. Um, the ECC is designed differently from UHPC. UHPC design with the concept of extreme dense packing, whereas ECC is designed with the concept of load sharing between the ingredients, the fiber, the, inter the interface, and the matrix, the load sharing between these components inside so that they resist localized fracture. They share load and they may be damaged, but they the low sharing effect prevents localization of brittle fracture. So that's how ECC was designed. The design basis is different. Therefore, the outcome, 
the you can see on this plot here is also very different. Now I can imagine there are situations where UHPC is very, very good and would be the preferred material. In other circumstances, especially where you have large tensile deformation, like limb slips, like coupling beams that I showed earlier, or joints, um, those are really cases where you really want the high tensile ductility and not necessarily got the high compressive strength. Okay. So uh, the second part of the question asks if ECC could be designed with uh, micro steel fiber. And the answer is yes. Uh, it has actually been done. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, what we found is that the use of synthetic fibers is more efficient for both from a performance point of view as well as from a cost point of view. For steel fibers, uh, you can make it work by reducing the, the diameter of the fibers uh, down to below 100 micron. Now, even though it could be done, it's expensive to do that for steel fiber. For synthetic fiber, actually the manufacturing process is very different and actually that allows by spinning uh, the polymer melt through a spinneret, a very tiny hole, it actually enables very high molecular alignment and strength of the fiber. And the, and the manufacturing cost is relatively uh, moderate. Um, so from that point of view, the synthetic fibers are more effective. There are also other concerns that has been expressed to me by others, other groups who have attempted the use of micro steel fibers, such as piercing the fingers when you are operating, when you are mixing. Uh, those very thin steel wires become needles, basically. There is also the corrosion problem and so on. So I, I'm not sure if I answer your question, uh, partner, but I. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that answered the question. Uh, so following up. The, um, we also have another question. In your presentation, it is shown that ECC is applied to RC coupling beam. So when we use ECC, can we reduce the transverse reinforcement? Definitely. Yeah, so those uh, that for those building coupling beams that I show you, the amount of steel reinforcement is drastically reduced compared to uh, in previous circumstances when normal concrete is used uh, and the steel uh, steel cage, basically a 3D steel cage has very dense steel reinforcements. So the cost and manufacturing of those beams are very uh, problematic to say the least. So these coupling beams are very ductile um, and yet the amount of steel reinforcement is substantially reduced. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is, uh, can you explain what mechanisms cause the self-healing and what cause this to occur? Okay, so actually there is not a, a deep secret uh, in how the material self-heals. Uh, once the ECC cracks, water and carbon dioxide enters the cracks and with the residual uh, cement, unhydrated cement, and the porcelains that are inside. So the water cement or water binder ratio is relatively low in these mixes. So there are plenty of residual unused uh, cement particles and porcelains. Once they are exposed to water and air, uh, they undergo continued hydration process as well as carbonation process. Um, and so uh, uh, continue porcelanic process and together with the carbon dioxide that, that actually does produce uh, carbonates in the uh, cracks. And so there is this filling effect and uh, you might ask, well, if that's so simple, then why does it happen in uh, other uh, concrete material? It does happen actually in other concrete material. Uh, what the difference is, is that ECC has such tight intrinsic crack width, less than 100 micron, and very often less than 15 micron. 
then therefore the volume of crack void that needs to be filled is much smaller than a common crack of millimeter size, which makes it very difficult to uh, to experience complete healing. So ECC has the advantage of having continued hydration, uh, posomatic reaction carbonation processes occurring in cracks that are intrinsically tight from the beginning. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, as we talked about self-healing, there is a follow-up question that um, will the self-healing cause any change to the strength? Um, not so much the strength. So this is an interesting question. Um, so we have studied uh, the uh, virgin material properties. We have also studied pre-cracked and then allow it to undergo self-healing. And typically what we found is that the strength and ductility can be retained, but the stiffness is slightly degraded. Now the amount of degradation depends on a number of factors, such as the initial damage, how far you have uh, the material has been damaged. Uh, if you have loaded it to only one or two percent, actually, that is very easy to get self, fairly full self healing. If you load it to much more than, than that, then it's more difficult. Um, now, the other factors are the environmental exposures. What kind of environment is the damaged material exposed to? whether you have a dry environment, you have a wet environment, you have a humid but not wet and so on. And what kind of chemical species are available? So a number of factors influence uh, the retaining of the initial properties. But in general, uh, I would say that uh, in most practical circumstances, is feasible to think of the material as having, let's say, at least uh, an 80% recovery in strength and ductility, to put it in a conservative co context. Um, and uh, understanding, however, that uh, the details depends, the exact numbers depend on the uh, exposed, exposed dead damage condition and exposure condition after damage. So, our question is, um, how does ECC compare with conventional concrete in terms of freeze, thaw, durability, and cost? OK, uh, so it behaves very well uh, compared to normal concrete. And uh, in fact, it does so without the need of, um, of any additional additives. Um, the uh, the material has an intrinsic uh, microstructure that tends to prevent damage mm -hmm. caused by freezing and thawing. And uh, also, one should understand that freezing and thawing damage typically comes from the internal pressure of water freezing in the pores, which leads to micro cracks inside the material. So, for concrete, this is dangerous because once the cracks forms inside, it, it simply extends because of the brittle nature. But for ECC, the material has tensile ductility to suppress the initiation and extension of those micro cracks. So we, what we found is that the freezing and thawing durability is very, very good. Great. And it meets uh, all the uh, industry requirements. So there are studies uh, are published for those who are interested. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about durability and then also the cost factor? Durability is very good under uh, not only freezing and thawing environments, but sulfate attack. Uh, you can think of, there are a good number of different uh, environments we have exposed the material to, and generally they behave very good. Um, so the the uh, in for those who are aware, this reminds me. I have a book published on this on ECC, and there is a whole chapter devoted to durability of the material, as well as durability of structures, 
which I actually show a good number of slices now um, that infrastructures that takes advantage of the durability of ECC to extend its service life. Uh, the cost of the material uh, on a unit uh, basis, on a unit uh, volume basis, for example, compared to normal concrete, uh, at this point in time, it would still be higher. Mm -hmm. But as I pointed out a moment ago, when you, if you use it properly and design the infrastructure, let's say the pavement that I showed earlier has half the thickness, so you're basically using half the amount of material compared to conventional concrete pavement. And uh, you can say the same thing for, for example, pipes. If by reducing the wall thickness of pipes and eliminating steel reinforcement, you can actually come out ahead in terms of cost per unit length of the pipe compared to conventional steel reinforced concrete pipe, for example. <laughs> but yes, uh, the on a unit, uh, let's say per cubic yard basis, ECC can be more expensive <laughs> and mostly coming expense coming from the synthetic bodies. Okay, so so it is the initial cost is expensive, but do you mean like the life cycle cost is much more um, better than the normal concrete? Is that what you want to say? Uh, no, what I want to say is that the uh, the, the life uh, the life cycle cost obviously is lower mm -hmm. because of the durability. But even the initial cost can be lower. Mm -hmm. okay. Why? Uh, if you go back to the pavement example, uh, here is the pavement. This pavement has only half the thickness of normal concrete pavement. So the cost of the pavement, you want to cover a given area, but by because of the reduction in the thickness, you actually reduce the volume of material, and that's day one. <laughs> that's the install cost. The install cost turns out in this example is only 44% of the normal steel reinforced concrete pavement with full thickness. Great. So as we on, are on this slide, we have another question re related to this slide that on one of the slides, a CO2 emission redu reduction using ECC was at 55%. Uh, so can you please elaborate how it was calculated, is there a reference available for this? Uh, yeah, so the, it, the, the general basis of calculation is the carbon footprint of the ingredients that goes into the ECC material, mm -hmm. um, the volume of material used in the pavement, um, and the other ingredients uh, such as steel reinforcements in the conventional case when you're making comparison. You, so here we don't have steel, so there's another savings there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no expansion joints. And so when you, this is how this is calculated, not on a unit volume basis of material, but on a pavement basis, say for the same amount of surface area of pavement. It's on that basis that this uh, carbon footprint is calculated. Okay, so the reference yeah. is the, uh, do you have a research paper? I think that's what the question was, I guess. Uh, so the reference for this um, is your research paper or is it your yeah. research? There is a research paper uh, right off now, uh, off my head, I don't remember whether it's already published. If not, it's already uh, okay. in, in, uh, in line for publication. But this is fairly recent results, and so okay. it will be available if not already. Okay, great. Uh, moving yeah. forward with our, another question. The so, can yes. also, also write me, and I can give more information. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So, our uh, next question is Are there any ongoing research initiatives or development that could further enhance the use of ECC in construction? Yeah, there are actually a lot of research being done now around the world. Uh, our group uh, have been doing it for years, but there are a good number of different groups 
uh, both in and outside of the U.S. Uh, that are conducting research studies uh, of ECC. So if you just Google ECC, um, you will find publications from different groups around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you want to ready reference the book that I mentioned um, that I published a few years back, have obviously a lot of references and uh, you can also find related groups that are doing research in this area. So the, yes, there is a lot of research being done that have mm -hmm. been done and are continuing on. Uh, so a lot of those are uh, addressing some of the initial shortcomings of ECC, uh, like the higher cost per material, like the higher carbon content. So recent, in recent years, uh, the cost and the carbon footprint of ECC has been going down very fast. Uh, there are a number of groups that are looking at using recycled material, uh, mm -hmm. recycled fibers and so on, for example. Um, and those addresses those initial concerns. Um, and of course, studies in how ECC is used in different contexts is also very common now. Yeah. So yeah, on, on the same line. So if a professional in the construction industry get, uh, wants to get trained or educated on the uh, uh, practical aspects of uh, how one can get this training and uh, on the practical aspects of working with ECC. So uh, are there well, enough resources available? Uh, well, I mentioned earlier the user guideline that uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, your organization is sponsoring. Um, so we have, we hope to have that put out within the next six months time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that should help. Uh, that's exactly for this purpose is to help industry get on uh, to using it, maybe leaving out some of the more exotic theor theories, uh, academic studies. Uh, but focusing on the practical use of the material. Um, so that's uh, the user guideline. Uh, there are a number of uh, user-oriented documents. So both uh, VDOT and MDOT have published uh, design guidelines. Uh, those should be helpful uh, mm -hmm. for industrial users. Uh, there are several countries that are actually publishing or updating their codes uh, to include mm -hmm. ECC, as I mentioned. Yeah. And I'm yeah. hoping that NCI would work uh, towards that. Uh, I think that's really helpful for design professionals uh, because I hear that they, they really want to use this material, but they also don't want to take the risk when it's not included mm -hmm. in the design. Yeah. In the, in the, in building design guidelines. So I, I totally, I'm totally with them and I hope that uh, some action of this kind uh, could happen. Yeah. Um, and you and I can discuss how we can offer training uh, in the future for industrial professionals. Yeah, sure. Um, we, so would, I, we would be happy to support this initiative. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, totally, I totally understand. Uh, the need for that. Uh, yeah. So this, this is another gap that I was, the challenge that we are facing in transitioning from where we are now to uh, broad applications. Yeah. So we have a few more questions. I, I'm just trying to finish or maybe I'll, I'll just try to uh, address a few of them. So our next question is uh, what structural tests have been conducted on various types of structures Continuous beams, frames, and continuous slabs. Um, yeah, uh, so all of the above. Uh, so there are studies, structural tests uh, in terms of slab behavior, in terms of column behavior, in terms of beam behavior, both bending and shear, uh, and so on. So there is yet another chapter on structural testing uh, in my book. Uh, and it documents the studies uh, both by ourselves, but also a, a good number of studies by other uh, very good structural testing uh, group, research groups 
around the world, <laughs> especially in Japan. Uh, the Building Research Institute, BRI, uh, in Tsukuba City, they have done a lot of structural testing of ECC members. So I would recommend uh, those literature to whoever is interested to um, deploy this kind of material. Um, in, in the US, I would uh, say that the West Coast is really prime for uh, mm -hmm. this kind of material. Uh, it can certainly address uh, problems of uh, over congestion of steel uh, in structures that are designed to withstand large earthquakes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there are lots of opportunities there, opportunities there um, for okay. this kind yeah. of material to be mm -hmm. used. Yes, so we have another question which says, uh, does ECC allow for placement in lower temperatures than conventional concrete? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, so there has been studies uh, of uh, ECC applied to cold climates. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I have I'm not aware of full scale use. I, I am aware of uh, research studies of that kind. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently it could be used. Uh, it has also, there is also studies, including by ourselves, uh, for ECC applied to construction in mm -hmm. hot and humid climate. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, our work uh, lately has been sponsored by Aramco, and they are interested to use this material in uh, Saudi Arabia, which has very high temperature. Great. So, yeah, yeah. so in fact, it, it is an important point to consider uh, for mm -hmm. temp different temperature environments where the material is used, the fresh properties could be inferenced, the setting time and so on, just like normal concrete that you expect mm -hmm. that you, you have to uh, take extra care when you have extreme conditions, whether it's very cold or very, very hot. Okay, yeah. So moving forward with next question. So um, we have this question on self-healing, but it's also the limitation. So self-healing of ECC does not apply for large amount of crack or damage. Is this the limitation of ECC? Uh, no, the, the proper way to think about that is not so much how many cracks, uh, but how wide the crack is. Mm -hmm. So if, if your damage causes uh, loading to, let's say, beyond 5% strain, which is already very large, then yes, you can localize cracks and it becomes very difficult to heal. But if you operate within the one, two, three percent, which is already much, much larger than normal concrete that you would design for, um, then you are you, you are in a situation where you have you can expect very robust self healing, uh, even if the number of cracks is large. So the number of cracks is different from the crack being wide. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Okay, I think that answers. So we have, um, like, as we were talking about limitations, so we have another questions uh, on limitations. Are there, are there considerations or limitations that the project manager should be aware of when incorporating ACC in their projects? Well, I would recommend that the project manager be very familiar with the material, the fresh property behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be different uh, from normal concrete and how to deal with those situations. So some amount of experiments, experimentation of the material in the fresh state, uh, the uh, some initial trial mixes and testing in the field, especially if you are operating in uh, extreme environments like very hot or very cold just now that we mentioned, you want to uh, field test the material and find out if there is any difference in behavior. Now, uh, another thing that comes to mind is that you want to make sure that you have mixers that have uh, strong power. Uh, 
to move the material inside. So the material at some moment during the mixing, uh, it could become very thick and then later on it would change. The rheology changes during the mixing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you have mixers that are strong, uh, that have enough power to move the material and make sure that the fibers are uniformly mixed. So that's extremely important, the uniformity of fiber dispersion. You don't want the fibers to come together and batch up in one corner and the rest mm -hmm. is just without fibers. So this is something that uh, ha that does come with some experience uh, mm -hmm. working with the material and uh, we, we, in the uh, user guide we are putting together, there are uh, some tips about how to carry out quality control. So uh, pay attention to those. Thank you, great. I think this is the last question we would like to take is, so uh, as for, I'm just reading the question. So as for my understanding, um, we use m a more proportion of cement uh, in ECC as compared to the regular concrete. So how it is contributing towards um, CO2 emissions? Well, uh, it, indeed in the uh, maybe 20 years ago when we started working with this material, the material does contain a large amount of cement. Uh, in the last several years, the amount of cement has been drastically reduced and replaced by porcelain material. Um, and we have found ways to gradually reduce the carbon footprint uh, along these lines. So the binder, there are three aspects to this. There, there are actually two main ones. Uh, that is the binder uh, composition. So reducing the cement content is key to that. Uh, Using LC3, for example, or LC2 uh, is another direction, but uh, basically deploying porcelains cleverly uh, can, can, can uh, reduce the carbon footprint of the binder. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fiber part. The fiber actually is a major challenge, uh, but as I mentioned, there are different groups now that are looking uh, and successfully use recycled fibers. Uh, that will be another way to address the carbon. Um, and a third point that I want to make again is what I already mentioned earlier, and that is the carbon footprint that we are most interested in is not the carbon footprint of each cubic yard of material. It's the carbon footprint of the structure that we want to build. Let's say if you want to build a hundred uh, hundred me square meter uh, of pavement, uh, you want the minimum amount of material to cover that area uh, with the resulting carbon footprint for that pavement being minimized. That's yeah. the carbon footprint you want to minimize. <laughs> and uh, in many ways, if you make good use of the properties of ECC such, such as the high MOL, the ability to eliminate steel in uh, appropriate circumstances, they all lead to a reduction of carbon footprint of the infrastructure. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Um, I don't know. There is one last question. I'll just take that uh, before uh, we finish. So are any manufacturers producing this product in a bag mix format? Uh, not that I'm aware of in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. I have heard about it in other countries, but uh, not in the US. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation and also for answering all the questions. Um, and so this uh, ends our question and answer session. So I just have a few slides um, show, uh, today just showing the next session, the next upcoming sessions. So um, so this is the list of upcoming webinars at ACI University. Please visit ACIUniversity.com to register them. 
um, and thank you uh, to the audience for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate uh, and we hope that you, we will see you at the, uh, in the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, our speaker. Uh, and this ends our webinar today. Thank you so much. Nice, nice, bye.